Welcome to Quoted Data's Friday show. I'm Jane Arana and I'm an analyst here at Quoted Data. As always, we'll be discussing some of the week's top stories and today we will also be joined by Andrew McCatty, who will run you through the biggest price and discount moves over March. We will then speak to our special guest, Yu Zhong Oh, who is an investment director on the Asian equities team at Aberdeen to discuss the Aberdeen Asian Income Fund. So we've had an extremely busy week for news, but today I'll be talking about fundraising for Hydrogen One Capital Growth, Supermarket Income Rate and International Public Partnerships, as well as some interesting portfolio updates at Gresham House Energy Storage, Next Energy Cellular and Cordiant Global Agricultural Income. So first up, Hydrogen One Capital Growth, which you may or may not know, is a relatively new trust as it only launched uh, in July last year into the renewable energy infrastructure space. As you can see, its shares have been consistently trading on a premium despite some share price volatility. So the trust announced on Monday this week plans to raise money to fund its immediate 45 million pipeline. It's actually identified a pipeline of 500 million plus, which includes a near-term pipeline of around 200 million undergoing advanced due diligence. However, this placing was for the immediate pipeline, which is already under exclusivity. So quick turnaround, the trust actually announced this morning that it had raised 21.5 million. Uh, the placing was supported by new and existing shareholders and was actually oversubscribed, so they had to exercise a scale back. The board said that it continues to actively consider the implementation of a share insurance programme in the near term in order to fund the broader pipeline, which, as I said, is currently in excess of 500 million. Next, we have Supermarket Income Re, which has also been trading on a consistent premium over the past year. Its share price has also risen quite significantly uh, over the last year. And if you follow the trust, then you'll know that it has a strong track record of successfully raising funds and deploying them within six months. So the last equity raise was in October last year and was actually oversubscribed at 200 million. This time around, the trust uh, yesterday announced its plans to raise 175 million through a placing. It's declared an issue price of 121 pence, which is a discount of 4.3% to the closing price on Wednesday this week, and a 7.1% premium to its last reported EPRA net tangible assets on 31st December 21. The company has a wider pipeline of 440 million, but it's identified a near-term acquisition pipeline of around 270 million, 150 million of that, which is already under exclusivity. The 175 million target issue together with borrowings should allow the trust to purchase some of its immediate target assets. And it's also said if the issue size is exceeded, it will consider acquiring additional assets in the wider pipeline. Finally, we have international public partnerships, which this morning announced it wants to raise 250 million by way of a placing, an open offer, offer for subscription and intermediaries offer. It's declared an issue price of 159.5 pence per share, and the plans are for the proceeds to pay down the cash drawn portion of its corporate debt facility, which at the moment stands at around 156 million pounds, and to provide additional funding for its pipeline. We actually posted a comment this morning saying that it's pleasing to see that this capital raising is open to a broad range of investors. As I'm sure you're all aware, institutional only fundraisings usually sewn up in a day or so and don't give smaller retail investors a, share a fair chance to get involved. So we think it's nice to see international public partnerships structuring this fundraising in a way that addresses this problem. So next we have portfolio updates. So Gresham House Energy Storage posted its annual results earlier this week, looking at the year to 31st of December 21. Actually had a strong year, achieving an NAV total return of 20.3% and a share price total return of 23%, which compares with an 18.3% return from its benchmark. However, it also announced in its results that it's seeking shareholder approval to make some changes to its investment policy. So the trust wants approval to invest up to 10% of its gross asset value into shovel ready project rights, as well as uh, the ability to invest up to 30% of gross asset value into certain international markets. It also wants to invest in the land under new or existing projects. Now the next AGM isn't until June, um, which it may seek shareholder approval in, in that next AGM, or there might be an EGM a bit sooner, but a date hasn't yet been confirmed. 
Next, we have the Next Energy Solar Fund, which has announced this morning that it started the construction of White Cross, which is a 36 megawatt subsidy free utility solar plant based in Lincolnshire. The original construction date was pushed back from the second half of last year due to volatility, um, but it says it has since stabilised, so construction is now underway and energisation of the plant is expected to start during the first quarter of next year. Once operational, White Cross will generate electricity for approximately 10,000 households yearly electricity consumption with renewable power. Now, this is particularly interesting because the White Cross project is going to benefit from a technology from Jinko Solar called N-type solar cells which is a bifacial solar technology, which offers superior power density and efficiency. Now, I'm not claiming to be an expert here, but I can tell you that the technology recently set a world record for its solar cell efficiency. Finally, we have Cordiant Global Agriculture Income, which uh, announced an IPO plan uh, on the 2nd of March of this year. You can go to our website to, to see that post and to see what it had planned. Um, but it's actually pausing its IPO process and it said given the current market backdrop and world events which are presenting challenges for many investors across existing portfolios and beyond, the company, company believes that it will be beneficial to seek an IPO at a later date. All subscriptions received by the intermediaries offer and offer for subscription will be returned to investors. So, absolutely whiz through that. <laughs> Next we have uh, Andrew with his uh, summary of March's price and discount movements. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jaina. I will just uh, share my screen. Uh, you had a lot to get through there. Uh, shame about the uh, Cordiant uh, IPO, but obviously a very tough time to be raising uh, new capital for something which was actually quite distinct and unique. So uh, hopefully they'll be able to uh, come back. So uh, as usual, I'll have a look at uh, what's been moving over the, uh, the last month or so. Um, there was quite actually a good list of rises um, over the last month. Uh, overall, the sector was up about uh, 2%, but there were, as you can see, quite a lot of rises over 15%. And I think they're scattered quite broadly, so I'm not sure there's a sector theme, but there are quite a lot of interesting stories here. So um, I'll talk about three of those uh, quite, quite quickly this morning. Uh, Geiger Counter, Ecofin Global Utilities and Infrastructure, and Hypnosis Songs Fund. And you can see they all had pretty good, good rises. Uh, amongst the uh, fallers, actually pretty muted uh, falls, uh, the, uh, most prices held up very, very well. Um, but there's always something going down. And I'm just going to talk about a couple of those in the energy efficiency sector. Uh, so I'll whiz straight on. I found I've got quite a lot to say about these, actually. Um, Geiger Counter, first of all, has been on the list of risers quite a lot over recent months. And the reason is very clear, really. Uh, as um, power supplies are interrupted and oil and gas supplies, <clears throat> excuse me, are interrupted. So this has um, uh, improved the prospects, I think, for the nuclear industry. And Geiger Counter is buying securities associated with the uranium uh, uh, market. And uranium is quite an odd commodity. It's not traded on the public markets. I mean, for obvious reasons, it's a dangerous thing. Uh, it's not traded on the public markets in the same way that you would find oil and gas or copper or sugar, any, any of those commodities. It's, uh, it's, it's a private market. Um, but the an indication, an indication of the price is published by two consultants every week, so you can find it. And on the left-hand chart here, I've got the, um, the price uh, in the year to date. And you can see it's written, uh, sorry, it's not the year to date, it's from January 21, so it's just 15 months or so. Uh, you can see that it's, it's basically it's doubled over this period uh, from about um, 30 to 60. So, there's been a very sharp rise in the uranium price. Uh, and in a way that's not surprising, um, given the background that we, we have now. And it has happened before. The right-hand chart here is a much longer chart. And it shows after a very quiet period in the 1990s and early 2000s, there was this massive price spike in 2007. Um, 
which was partly a supply side shock, there was flooding of the world's biggest mine in Saskatchewan. Um, but really it was more to do with hopes of expansion of the nuclear power industry in China and India. And, um, and you do wonder whether there might be a similar period to come now and therefore further price strength for uranium. And um, yesterday or the day before, um, a new British energy security strategy was launched. And obviously this is extremely topical at the moment with the security of oil and gas supplies at the top of the agenda here and in other countries such as Germany. Um, this is, fairly, this is a, a, a clip from the statement, which I won't expect you to read, but it's basically suggesting that the government is thinking quite um, uh, strongly now that um, nuclear power should form part of its future strategy along with renewables. And that um, a series of smaller nuclear reactors may be quite sensible uh, to ensure uh, the continuity of our future energy. So I think nuclear power is certainly back on the agenda here. And I suspect very much that's, that's true with other countries as well. So that may augur well for the uranium price to maintain and perhaps extend its recent strength, which could be good for Geiger counter. Uh, so moving on, uh, ECOFIN Global Utilities and Infrastructure is interesting because um, when you see the, the name Utilities and Infrastructure, you don't really expect this to be the sort of trust that's going to leap by 20% in a month. Um, but that has happened and I thought I'd better dig into exactly why. Um, this is, um, for me, it's a little bit like TR Property is in the property sector. It's quite unusual because it's investing directly uh, in equities rather than in, in individual assets, unlike most of the rest of the sector. So it's a slight outlier uh, and therefore it's ignored by some investors. But the reason it's risen so strongly is that it is a direct beneficiary of the strong power prices, of rising power prices. Uh, and you can see, um, here that we have a list of some of the some of the stocks that it holds that are particularly um, benefiting from this. So uh, RWE, Drax, Greencoat UK Wind, which we know well, uh, and that is quite widely known as the most uh, obvious beneficiary of rising power prices in the group of renewable energy investment trusts, uh, because it has fixed the smallest proportion of its, its revenues and therefore can benefit from the fluctuations. Um, but it's quite very interesting. That's why it's done so well. And the shares have been strong. They've, they've gone up with the NAV and the shares stand on a 1% premium to NAV. Um, I was going to leave it there actually in terms of this trust, but I, I, it just set me thinking because this was a little bit of a surprise that it had, had gone up. I think. It wasn't widely appreciated in the market. This trust was a beneficiary of rising power prices. I wondered if there might be another one. And, and I found one, which is quite interesting. So I've just left the, the top 10 of the ECOFIN trust there. So this other trust that I, I found uh, also has 7% in Drex, 7% in China Suntian, 6% in RWE, 5% in Green Cape UK Wind. It's also got Gresham House Energy Storage there, which Jane was talking about, and has had a very, very good week, and Next Energy Solar Fund as well. So this has a, a great deal of overlap and should also be a very major beneficiary of rising power prices. But the interesting thing is that this trust has not moved a jot in the last month. So I thought there might be an opportunity there. Uh, so let's go to the big, uh, the big reveal. It's a uh, premier might in global renewables. And I think the reason this trust may have been overlooked is that it, it is a very small trust. Its uh, assets are only about 40 million pounds. So it's quite illiquid and will not be on the radar of, of that many investors. Um, but this is a one year chart here and you can see the NAV in green has indeed shot up over the last month. Uh, it's it's um, had a similar uh, strength of rise to the ECOFIN Trust, 
but the share price here, as you can see, is totally flat, which is why the, uh, the discount, which has typically averaged about 10% over this period, has widened out very considerably, and this morning it was 18.7%. Uh, so I think there could be an opportunity here. I mean, clearly you need to do your own research and have a look at the trust and consider whether in terms of the liquidity, it might be suitable. But I think that's very interesting and indicates to me that there are little pockets of this industry still where there is hidden value to be found. Um, I'll move on to Hypnosis Songs Fund, which um, had a very big dip actually at the time of the beginning of the, the war in Ukraine, um, which was a bit of a surprise to me. In fact, I recommended the shares. They were one of my ISA picks for the year in March at 106, which turned out down here to be a very good call so far. Um, but I think what it indicated was that the trust has not been very effective in convincing investors of its uncorrelated returns. Because if ever there were a trust that you would think might hold its value during this tricky period, it would be this royal, music royalty trust, which really shouldn't be correlated with global equities at all. So the trust, I think, has some work to do in terms of um, how it's communicating its message. Uh, and I think as well, it made a big strategic error um, almost a year ago in June last year, when it, it said it wasn't going to raise any more capital for a year. And um, the reason for doing that was that I think it was quite a lot of fatigue about the, uh, the, the very regular capital raisings it had had. Um, but to my mind, they, they, it did exactly what it had always set out to do. It said there was this one-off opportunity to acquire all of these music assets and it needed to move quickly. So it raised a lot of capital, um, but clearly needed to pause. They must have had some feedback from investors. Um, but that's a shame because it's uh, now finding its capital structure is somewhat under pressure. And there has been a little bit of negativity about its uh, debt structure, which is quite short term and is not matched very well to the long term nature of the, the, uh, the revenue streams from the assets. It could really just do with raising some more capital, partly because it's missing out on opportunities. Uh, and I think probably it would like to do that uh, once this year is up, which will take it, I think, to the first week in June. Uh, but the problem is that the shares at about 120-ish uh, are at a discount, the NAV now of 131.8. So it would have difficulty raising capital at the moment. So my feeling is that it's probably going to launch a bit of a charm offensive now to see if it can get that discount um, tightening uh, or removed it completely. And um, there is an intriguing possibility here that if it is not able to do that and therefore not able to raise more capital, there is a slim chance of a takeover, I think, because Hypnosis has uh, partnered with Blackstone uh, in the US uh, so that Blackstone has, asset, uh, has access to its deal flow. And that's great news for Blackstone at the moment because Hypnosis doesn't have the cash to participate. So it's getting all of the deals um, and it's probably quite enjoying that. Um, and if this trust is not able to raise any more money, then its existing uh, catalogue, which is extremely attractive, uh, might just prove a very attractive um, uh, asset for Blackstone to consider buying. Um, there's an additional factor there, which is that Blackstone is currently paying management fees to, uh, to hypnosis uh, uh, management, uh, which is owned by Song, by, by the trust. So if Blackstone were to buy it, it would save itself some money on the, um, on the management fees as well. Um, I don't really know how feasible that is, but it has been mooted. And, um, and I think it's quite intriguing here that um, one way or another, I think we might see a bit of appreciation, either because the trust is able to get its NAV, uh, its uh, share price back up to NAV, or because of some um, uh, corporate uh, activity. And um, that was all really good, but I think we'll, we'll just uh, finish with a little bit of gloom, shall we? Um, the two energy efficiency trusts that uh, were on the list of fallers there, 
Aquila and Triple Point. Um, they've both been pretty awful, actually, since IPO. Um, the, uh, we have, we have uh, Aquila here is the, the black line. Uh, basically, it peaked on the day of its IPO and has been falling ever since. Pretty, pretty dreadful. Um, uh, triple points have been going a little bit longer. It started off okay, but it's been fallen off since. Um, the issue here has really been the pace of investment, which has been very slow in both cases. Uh, so it took Aquila seven months just to announce one single investment. Um, and that caused a row with a couple of its board members who resigned. Uh, so that's clearly cast a cloud over the trust. And uh, Triple Point, which um, you know, was launched back in October 2020, has only just uh, become fully invested. So again, that took a long time. It was quite a slow process. And, and I think uh, investors have become a little bit disenchanted here. Um, it's not a, really that much of a surprise that this has happened um, to, to certain trusts in this sector because a great deal of money has been raised very rapidly for this whole sector of renewable energy, green energy, energy efficiency. Uh, and there's bound to be this period now where investors sort the wheat from the chaff a little bit. Um, Expectations are always very high at the time of IPO. Uh, these very articulate managers are always able to give us great uh, cases for exactly what they'd like to do with the money. Uh, of course, the proof of the pudding is when they actually go ahead and invest it or, or don't, uh, as, as the case may be. Uh, so there is always that scope for disappointment. And uh, whilst it can cost you more if you wait and you decide to have a look and, and maybe buy in a year later. That can cost you more because they might be they might stand at a premium. But uh, typically, actually, the the dividend income you'll receive in the first year is greatly reduced anyway. So there's an opportunity cost uh, to um, uh, to, uh, to to investing in these things. And my feeling is that whilst it's really good to have the expansion of choice and lovely to have all of these new issues coming onto the market, uh, if you can get somebody else to fund it uh, and you can sit back and, and wait for a year to see how everything goes, uh, then you can avoid some of the risk and hopefully some of the uh, disappointments. Um, I just noticed there's a couple of questions, so I'll just um, address those before I finish. Uh, the first one, uh, about the uranium market it being in supply deficit with inventories being run down. Um, the, my honest answer there is that I don't know, um, but it seems to me from the price action that there's certainly a bit of uh, supply and demand imbalance at the present time. Uh, and I think the supply might be interrupted a little bit in Kazakhstan. And, and certainly it seems to me there's quite a lot of momentum building about potential future demand here. So uh, I, I agree, I think there's some good potential upside on the Iranian price. And the second question is just uh, about the Premier Might and uh, Global Renewables Trust. It, it is still run by James Smith. I, um, I'm, I, I met him a few weeks back. Um, uh, and does it still have the highly leveraged structure? Um, yes and no. Um, it is leveraged with uh, zeros, uh, and it used to have um, a lot more, actually. So it's much less leveraged than it was, um, but it is still leveraged, uh, and it really could do with being a much bigger trust. So there are issues there within the structure for you to think about, uh, perhaps reasons for a discount. It just seems a bit too wide uh, to me at the present time. Uh, good. I've talked for long enough. Um, uh, some interesting stuff there, I think. I will uh, hand you back now to Jaina. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Thank you very much, Andrew.